Get your Bibles out now, and please turn to Genesis chapter 20. We got through chapter 19, man. We had to beat our way through there, but there was a lot in chapter 19, and really uh, a lot of depravity if you get right down to it in chapter 19 there with Sodom and everything. You know, chapter 20, now we're going to read a familiar story, I want to say, as we go in there. But it's a familiar story, and it's almost a repeat of chapter 12, in a sense. And you're going to know what I'm talking about in a minute. It's kind of like a deja vu of chapter 12. And Abraham is going to be in a new location, but it's going to be the same old Abraham pulling the same old stuff. Uh, he's not going to be in Egypt with the Pharaoh. Abraham's moving to a different location, and he, he moves to another pagan location, pagan king area, and repeats a particular sin, and you guessed it. Tell them, you're my sister, right? He repeats it again. He repeats it sin. Tell them, you are my sister. Sister, Sarah, his wife, if you remember back there with the Pharaoh in Egypt, same thing. You thought he would have learned last time. Don't be doing that again, right? Nope, second verse, same as the first. By the way, that is the title of my message tonight, is second verse, same as the first. But we're going to move on. You know, last week in chapter 19, we witnessed Abram, or Abram we seen there, and, and it spoke of him going out and witnessing the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Sodom and Gomorrah had could be completely destroyed. In chapter 19, verse 27, if you look there, it said, Abraham went early in the morning to a place where he had stood before the Lord. Remember, this is where he stood before and he wheeled and dealed with God, with the Lord about how many it would take to save Sodom. But he went there and stood before where he had stood before the Lord before. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and that toward all the land of the plain. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace, there it says. He looks over there and sees the horror of this region. What had taken place? Just the horror of the entire region gone, destroyed, burn up, cities plant life, everything up in smoke, thousands upon thousands killed too. Thousands upon thousands had been killed there. God's judgment had passed on Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's looking over that. We've seen that in chapter 19 there. You know, chapter 19, as we had studied through there from the time, you know, those angels entered into Sodom, and of course all that debauchery that took place there, all that sexual immorality, is a picture, i got to say, of Sodom and that region, a picture of sin unchecked, just total sin unchecked, and a judgment that was really just right for that region. It was burned up. The sin of Sodom, it brought forth death of thousands, thousands. It was a wicked, wicked city. James 1.15 then when a desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. The sin of Sodom brought forth death. Now, the sin of Sodom, we might think, well, that was really extreme, right? Extreme. Every young man, every older man that wanted to come and take advantage and rape these, these men that came into Lot's house. Then we went on beyond that. And then we last week we studied where Lot's daughters got him drunk and, and laid with him. We think it's really extreme, over the top. You know, the sin of sin, man. Sodom and Gomorrah, that's the sin of sin. And our sin, of course, is not like Sodom. No, no, no. It's got to be to a less degree. It's not even, not even close to that kind of sin, we would think. And then we might say to ourselves, well, what kind of judgment would God put on me for my sin? You know, it's not like Sodom at all. It can't be the same. It can't be that same judgment. What came upon them? Death. Death came upon them. What judgment would God give me for my sin? Sin is sin we understand that? Sin is sin. All 
unrepented sin leads to death. All unrepented sin. In John, 1 John 5, 17, all unrighteousness is sin, period. If you're not perfect, if it's not just righteous, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. Now, I'm not going to go into this because, you know what, I know the men are stuttering in 1 John, and you probably haven't got there, so I'm not going to blow it all apart for you, Brother Jesse, as you leave that Bible study. But all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. Now, what is that sin not leading to death? Well, that's repented sin. That literally is when you repent of sin, you give your life to the Lord. There is sin that's not leading to death, but there is sin leading to death. See, the death in Sodom, well, the death that came upon Sodom, and that judgment of God, that was total unrepented sin. And so judgment came upon them. Judgment came, but guess what? You know, all we sin. You know, they say we live in a dispensation of grace after the cross, a time of grace. Well, God's had grace from the very beginning. We see it all through the Bible. The judgment might have come, but there was also grace and mercy. Lot was delivered, was he not? Lot was delivered out of there. Well, him and his family, of course, his wife became a pillar of salt, and then his two daughters, they just went nuts, all right. But anyway, Lot came out of there. Abram had to pray. He had prayed that God would deliver his nephew there. Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right, he told God. He said that to God. Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Now, we've got to ask ourselves, in this situation, before we get into chapter 20 here, why was Lot saved? Why was Lot saved? And why was Sodom and the rest of the people destroyed? God's choice, guys. God's choice. God's judgment. Turn your Bibles, if you want to, to 2 Peter. Peter writes about this situation there, along with another one. Well, several other ones, actually. In 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, it says, For, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into the chains of the darkness to be reserved for judgment. Now, you guys know who these angels he's talking about that sinned? You know, these angels that came down and, and uh, had children with the, the women of men before Noah's time. You know why, why God destroyed the earth, destroyed all the people? Well, because they were mutants, basically. They weren't human anymore, and only Noah was genetically pure, Noah and his family. And so that's the reason they were saved. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down into hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, it says, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bring, bringing in the flood on the world of ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah now into ashes, speaks of that in Peter. Condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly lives. You know, you can even ask the secular world about Sodom and Gomorrah. And many people go, oh yeah, oh, a wicked place and God destroyed it. You know, they don't even have to know the Bible. It's known out there. Why? It was set as an example, was it not? And he says, and, and then delivered righteous lot. Man. We're reading there, I'm not so sure how righteous Lot was, but it says they delivered righteous Lot and was oppressed by the, who, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. In verse 8, kind of in parentheses, it says, For the righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. He put himself in a place where he literally is being tortured by this. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Talking about delivering, right? Delivered Lot, delivered Noah and his family. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of, uh, out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. God knows 
the righteous in the wicked. Why was Lot saved and Sodom and the rest destroyed? Because God knows, you see. God knew there was no repentance hearts in there. You know, like I spoke, I believe it was last time or the time before, Lot is, as Noah, also a picture of the church, the rapture of the church, removed from the judgment before the tribulation comes down. And God knows, God knows, see, those true hearts. God knows the true Christian. We can raise our hand all day long and say, I'm a Christian, right? God knows the true hearts, the ones who've given their lives to him. And he knows the true sinners, right? And he knows those who have repented and walked away from their sin and given their lives to the Lord. God knows those things. In 1 John 1, 9, he says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As Christians, isn't that the greatest thing in the world? As a, as a non-believer, if they would only understand that, come to the Lord, confess your sins, and guess what? You'll be cleaned up. You're washed by the blood. In verse 10, it says, though, if we say that we have not sinned, hmm, we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. You know, with all this we've read so far, and of course the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, guys, it's not the sin that brings judgment, eternal damnation. It's unrepented sin. Do we understand that? It's literally unrepented sin. God is faithful and God is just to forgive us our sins and forget, would have get, forgave those in Sodom too. Had there been repentance, you guys know about uh, Nineveh, right? You study Jonah, guys, right? Nineveh, boy, they repented. He held back on them. Anyway, let's uh, pray. We're going to get into the night's message here. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for you uh, gathering us here together. And as we study here in chapter 20 of Genesis, Lord, I pray, Lord, you'll just speak to us. Show us uh, what you have for us tonight through your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I told you the title of my message already, second verse, same as the first, right? Second verse, same as the first. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 20. It says, And Abraham now journeyed from there to the south, from where he'd been living, near, he was quite a ways from Sodom and Gomorrah, but up on, in the mountains. He journeyed from there to uh, south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur. And he stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. Oh my goodness, Abraham again. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah, it says. First two verses. Is this not a familiar story? We read this back in chapter 12, right? Abraham again does this. Hey, you're my sister. Now, let's start off first. Why did Abraham move? Why did he move from where he was? We don't see him praying about it. We don't tell him. It's God telling him, move from there. Why did he move? You know what, guys? I think he didn't want to be there in sight of where Sodom and Gomorrah was and have to get up every day and look across there and see the scorched ground. And knowing the judgment that had taken place, he did not want to see it in the world. He didn't want to live near that region at all. It was a reminder of the judgment. And so I believe that he basically wanted to get up and just go to a new place, you know. Remember last week, if you were here, talked about how we sometimes running from our sin will go to a different location, right? Well, I'm going to go to a new geography. And, and when I'm living over here, I won't have that attached to me anymore. Well, the fact of the matter is, your sin is your sin. Until you give it over to the Lord, it don't matter where you live, it's going to be with you because you're there, right? You can't run from your own sin. You can't change it by geographically going somewhere else. But Abraham here, if we look at it this way, he didn't want to see that anymore. Abraham was moving away from other sin, right? He was leaving those other sin there. 
He didn't want that reminder of the sin of Sodom. These are two totally different concepts. You see what I'm saying? You're running, taking your sin with you. Like I told you, I told you about how Diane and I moved to California. My golly, the same people that were here were over there. Right? Because we were there. We brought it with us. But it's two different uh, concepts. One, you're, you're trying to run from your sin and not giving it to God and dealing with it. And the other one is, well, if you hang back and you hang with others who are in sin, you hang there with them. In 1 Timothy 5.22, now Paul's writing this to Timothy, and he's telling him as a pastor, and he's speaking about leaders. But we can take application from this very easily. It says, do not lay hands on anyone. Associate, right? Don't lay hands on them. What he's talking about, lifting up leaders. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say we can take application. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Obviously, with leadership, you gotta be, you got to test them, test them, test them before you put them into a position because guess what? Once you put them in a position and you find a sin, you own it. You own it now as a pastor. But here, well, let's take it into application here, hanging with others that sin. You, you associate with them. Man, these are my good friends. I hang out there all the time. They're good buddies of mine, you know? Well, you're going to share in their sin. Fact of the matter is, you got to watch where you hang out. Ephesians 5, 6 and 7. Let no one deceive you with empty words. The world's full of empty words, church. For because, uh, for because of uh, these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Didi disobedience. Boy, I'm stumbling over that. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. See, I think Abraham wanted to get away from that region because of what took place. You know, when we hang with, uh, with the sin of others, basically, right? We hang out there. We're looking to fall to the same, period. You know, I, I always tell them, don't step into the lion's den and not expect it to get eaten, right? If you're going to go in the lion's den and hang out in the lion's den, trust me, you will get eaten eventually, period. You're not Daniel, right? <laughs> but we'll fall to the same. You know, I, I like to say, choose your friends wisely. I always told my kids and my grandkids, I said, in reality, you don't have very many friends. If you got a handful of friends, real friends, you probably got too many, right? Because friends take time. And one thing I say about friends, here's my definition of a friend. It may sound a little crude. A friend is somebody you can use, and they can use you. That's a friend. One you can use, you'll never question, and they can use you too. That's a true friend with you thick and thin. You need to be careful of who we choose as our friends, if you call that, or even associate with them, those we associate with. And so I think that's part of why Abraham moved. Now, Abraham moved, but guess what? Abraham took his old sin with him too. Tell them you're my sister of all things. Second verse, same as the first, right? What was Abraham thinking? It didn't work out so good in Egypt, you know? What happened there? Well, he got rebuked. He got rebuked by the world. He got rebuked by a, a pagan, right, by the Pharaoh. What was he thinking? Well, you know... Uh, is it going to come out different this time? Is that what he was thinking when he said that? Abraham's same lie that he told in Genesis 12. What does that show us, church? He does the same thing. Now, this is literally 25, 30 years later in his life. Literally 25, 30 years later. What does this show? What he did then, he brings and he does it again. It's easy to slip back into familiar territory. It's real easy to slip back. 
It's easy to slip back to the same sinful habits. Second verse, same as the first. It's easy to slide back there. The same sin can return into our life. Exactly what Abraham's doing here. See, his age didn't, didn't improve him either in this. Abraham's now 100 years old. He didn't get sanctified just because he was older, you know. He's not sanctified from that. He, it had, he hadn't dealt with this one. The sin was a, was a past, and he, it was a familiar friend, I want to say, for Abraham, this one here. Well, actually, it's a familiar enemy, and we'll see that. I mean, he gets rebuked heavily by this king. Sanctification. What is sanctification with the Lord? You know, a lot of times the church doesn't talk about sanctification enough. But the fact of the matter is, sanctification is a work God does in your hearts. And it takes place over uh, time and with different parts of our lives and different issues in our life. And when we honor God with our hearts, he sanctifies a little more and a little more. It's sanctification. It's a, number, it's, a, it's a matter of knowing. It's really important. Part of sanctification is actually knowing our sinful nature and then repenting and walking away from it. That's part of our sanctification. Giving reign to God in our lives, over our lives, and many, many different issues. It's not like, you know, all of a sudden God goes, boom, you're sanctified in everything. It takes a little time. Abraham hasn't learned this one. Not returning to that past sin. You know, I'm not going to go into a list, but there's certain things that God has done sanctification in me. Those, I do not believe, are going to ever come back. Will not stumble there. You know, we, and, and having, you know, what it, I think it's just the, the hope we have in the Lord. You know, boldly standing, boldly standing in that hope, too. When you have that sanctification, you got cleansed of that. 1 Peter 3.15. I use this scripture because it's important, I, th I think, with our sanctification. And it says here, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, right? That is to know your God. And as you... As you uh, are sanctified in different areas of life, you come to know your God in a greater, greater way. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that's in you, you see. Now, I can, I can go talk to this gentleman down the road or this gentleman down the road here who are struggling with the problems I used to have, and I can talk to him and I can say, you know what, I was there, man. I can tell you the one who can clear it out. But you've got to give it over to him. And maybe you're going to have to give it over to him twice and three times. But we'll do it together, right? Sanctification. With meekness and fear, having great humility, right? Having that great humility. But Abraham, Abraham, he, uh, he still lacks something here. You know, he lacked trust. Because what did he do? He goes there, and the first thing he's telling him is, say, you're my sister. And what happened? Abimelech the king, Gerar, sent and took Sarah now. He lacked trust in God. He lacked trust in God to protect him and his family and all he had. Abraham, Abraham, uh, well, he was fearing the fact that if they knew, see, that Sarah was his sister. He was a very, very wealthy man, right? He's a very wealthy man, and I guess Sarah was still kind of attractive, even at 90 years old, that it could go wrong for him. And he didn't trust God. See, he had the wrong fear, though. He feared what man would do to him, what possibly man could do to him. He didn't fear, he, wasn't, he didn't fear what God could do to him, and we're going to see what takes place. But he was learning. And you know what? God's graciously teaching him. I got a note here. A uh, commentator by Morris. You know, I was thinking, was Sarah at 90 years old still that desirable? Right? This king takes 
Sarah. Now, obviously, uh, she, she has to be decent looking. He says here, Morris says, we should not ignore the idea of Sarah's attractiveness. Do not uh, the, ignore the idea of Sarah's attractiveness even at an old age, at 90 years old. She had in some measure been physically rejuvenated, he says, in order to conceive and bear. Absolutely. She was probably past menopause when, she went, when God had to rejuvenate her womb in order to conceive and bear and nurse Isaac. And possibly this manifested itself into a renewed beauty as well, Morris says. Possibly. I kind of liked it. Let's go into verse 3. Man, we got to move on. Whew. We're going to get through here. Now, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. This gets crazy, man. Come to him in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man. Could you imagine that? You got a dream and God's going, you're a dead man. Holy smokes, man. He says, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? He knew the whole, the whole nation would be slayed over this. Did he not say to me, he, uh, she is my sister and even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. And God said to him in a, in a dream, yes, I know. This is amazing. This is a pagan king. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this integrity of your heart, for I, uh, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Either. God was holding him back. Did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, and all who are yours. Man, that's a dream there. I'm telling you. You're a dead man, he tells him. You're a dead man. That's scary, guys. You know, God wasn't fooling around here one bit. Mm. God had to intervene. He had to intervene quickly to protect the womb of Sarah. We know the lineage comes all the way down to Jesus Christ from Abraham and Sarah, the, the ancestry down there. He could not allow another seed to come into that womb, and God had to come in. He was not fooling around. Abimelech, well, he gets the message. He gets it clear. He gets it straight. No touchy her, right? No touchy. Don't go there. Think about this as this story proceeds. Abimelech is more righteous than Abraham. Literally. This pagan king is more righteous than Abraham. He had more integrity God even said so right there. You know how sad that is when we see that in the world today? And I've seen it many, many times. A non-believer with more integrity than a Christian, or so-called Christian, right? These non-believers will have more integrity. You'll see their family is solid, man. They got good kids. The kids are well and obedient. The, the wife is a wonderful wife. The husband's a, a good husband. They run a good business or whatever, and they have this integrity about them. They're not even Christians, you know. They're atheists or, you know, pagans or whatever you want to call them out there. But they have this integrity. That's really sad to see. You know, it's very unexpected, but it's sometimes you actually see it. They will have greater integrity. They'll have greater integrity in family situations. They'll have greater integrity in the workplace, work harder, you know. Any Christian to this does not work hard in the workplace. I'm sorry. You, you know, you need to read the word of God. Do your work unto the Lord and not unto man and get it done, right? They won't work hard. They're, they, you know, business deals even. Man, I've known some Christians that I, you know, they'll put, their, they'll put a logo or they'll put a scripture on their card and then they'll cheat their customer. They won't do a good job. They'll rob them. 
you know, living lives without integrity. James 4, 17. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. You know, I brought, put that up there so many times. I love that verse. Integrity of Christian. If you know what to do and do good and you don't do it, that is sin. Living lives without integrity, knowing the sin that's happening. Now, God even recognized this integrity of this pagan king, and he recognized the heart of him. And God guides even this pagan king. You see that in verse 6? He says, and God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you uh, did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, I wondered about that. Did he physically keep him back? Here's what I think. Personally, it's just my thought. Okay, this is Pastor Dennis. I think that Sarah was on her period. I think she was in menstruation. And this is how God prevented her, him from taking her because they would not do that, would not take her in that. It's me thinking, all right? How else did he? Did he pull him back? I don't know. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, he says right there. God had guided this man, kept him from, God intervened with this man. In verse, uh, in verse, six, verse 6, and God said to him in a dream, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. He kept him from doing something, right? I think about that. I think about that for those pagan leaders in our country today, guys. You don't think God's more than able? More than able than to keep them from doing something? Absolutely he is. We need to pray that God intervene in our nation. Maybe just like that. You know, come in a dream. You're a dead man if you do that. By the way, you're a dead lady if you do that, Nancy. You know? Oh, did I say that? Oh, I'm going to get canceled for that one, Pelosi. <laughs> we need to pray that way, guys, seriously. God actually commends Abimelech here, right? He commends him. You did good. He keeps him from a worse sin. He commended him, and then he kept him from a worse sin here. And God confirms in verse 7 there uh, that Abraham's a prophet now. This is interesting. He says he's a prophet, and he'll pray for you, and everything will go well. Guys, the, the power of prayer, we need more prayer. We need more prayer in the church. We need to be praying for our nation. We need to be praying for our leaders. How about our prayer? Does it have power? Well, he says right here, Now therefore, restore the man's wife, for he's a prophet, and he'll pray for you, and you shall live. And all these things, and you'll see here, everything gets better when he prays for him. How about our prayer? Are we praying for our nation's leader that God will guide them? You know, I mean, he can come to them in a dream, too, and threaten them if that's okay with me. But will he guide them? All change starts with prayer, and it starts with repentance. You know, sharing this with my brother, uh, I believe that God needs to move the church to repentance. Much, much, much sin within the church. Repentance. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, who are called by my name, Christians. Us, the church, are called by my name. Obviously, it was Israel back then. Will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Repent, repent, repent. We need to repent as a church. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Without repentance, you see, in the church, God's doing this, man. He's going la, 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 la. Seriously, seriously, 
There are pastors who are in grievous, grievous sin, and God's going, la, 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 la. What do you mean I'm going to heal your land? You know, you guys need to repent. You need to turn from your wicked way. Then I'll heal it. <clears throat> Change the ways and, and then pray, right? You need to come for a revival for the church, not a revival of the world out there, the non-believer. We need a revival within the church nationwide. Revival begins with repentance and prayer. There needs to be a cleansing, I really believe. Man, the stuff I catch on YouTube and all these different things, there needs to be some cleansing within the church or so-called church. See, God can bless sin, now can he? How's God going to bless sin? It's against his total, total nature. You know, it should not be God bless America. It needs to be America bless God. He's blessed us enough, man. We've had it all. No, it's not God bless America. America bless God. You need a change of heart. Psalm 139, 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. This is what every Christian needs to pray and needs to ask the Lord to do. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, test me, right? And know my anxieties, know my sin, know my everything about me. And see if there's any wicked way in me. Test me, God. Check me out here and lead me now. Move me to repentance, to ever, the way of everlasting. Move me to repentance. Abraham, he deserves great rebuke. We're going to get back to the story here. Same as before here, where it's going to come from the world as we read it in verse 8 now. So Abimelech rose early in the morning called all his servants and told all these things in their hearing, and the men were very much afraid, it says. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? I bet he's a little ticked off. What have you done to us? How have I offended you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds uh, to me that ought not to be done. Then Abimelech said to Abraham, Why did you, What did you have in view? That you've done this thing? That's a good question. What did you have in view right here, Abraham? See, Abimelech was 100% right. Here it was, a pagan king, a person from the world, rebuking Abraham, right? God's man, Abraham, this pagan king. Again, how sad that is. Abraham, a man of God, rebuked by a man of the world. How many times I've seen that. What, you're a Christian, you know? Man of the world. Is that the way you Christians act? Guys, we must remain, I want to say honorable, honorable before the world. In all our actions, what we say, what we do, the way we deal with people, everything, we have to be honorable. Our conduct needs to be good. In 1 Peter 2.12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, among the non-believers. That when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, you see, that honorableness, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Abraham, in this story here, was totally opposite. He was not honorable. His conduct was shameful, and it was by any means not glorifying, which they observe, glorify the God in the day of visitation. He was not glorifying God to this Abimelech one bit. In verse 10 there, we read, and Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you have in view? <laughs> I love this when he says this. What did you have in view that you'd done this thing? That's a perfect question he put before him there. What do you have in view, man? Well, I can tell you one thing. He didn't have God in view. Not at all. He wasn't thinking the Lord, and he was not trusting God. God is working on Abraham in trust, trusting him. You know, Jesus tells us to keep him in view, right? We need to stay focused, guys, especially in these times we're in. We need to stay focused. We can get, man, I'll tell you what, I can go here and there, my focus, and I can go all over the place, and then I got to go, okay, Jesus, kingdom of heaven. Stay focused on the kingdom of heaven. 
Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things will be added. All those other things will come and take, well, they'll come into view. They'll be taken care of. We need to stay focused. Obviously, Abraham, he wasn't, didn't have God in view. Now we're going to get Abraham's excuse here. Trust me, we'll make it through chapter 20. He's going to get this excuse in verse, uh, verse 11 now. And Abraham said, because I thought surely, why did you do this? And he says, what were you thinking? And Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God now is not in this place and they will kill me on account of my wife. Where's your trust, Abraham? But indeed, she is truly my sister. She is the she is truly my sister, he says. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. He married his half-sister, and she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me. Here's his excuses. You see, there's like three of them in here. And, uh, and he said, it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, this is your kindness that you should do for me in every place, wherever we go. Say of me, he is my brother, as he responds to Abimelech there. <laughs> oh, man. His excuse. Well, part of it's true, you know, and part of it's a lie. Part of it's true and part of it's a lie. Well, she is my sister. She's my half-sister. But the part was she wasn't, he didn't say she was my wife also. Part's true, part a lie. What a great excuse he had there, you know? What a great excuse. Abraham's concern, one of his concerns he said there was he, he said that uh, surely the fear of God was not in this place, right? Well, the fact of the matter is, there was no fear of God in Abraham either, as he told this part truth, part lie. She is truly my sister now, he says. She's truly my sister. He's attempting to justify his sin, you see? He's attempting to justify his sin before Abimelech and actually before God at the same time. Half-truth. When we were in this before, this same story basically back in chapter 12, a half-truth is a full lie, church, period. A half-truth is a full lie. What you're doing when you're telling a half a truth, you're not telling all the truth, is you're intending on deceiving. It's so you can deceive or manipulate, so you'll tell half the truth. Half the truth is a full lie. Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life, and there are, there's many issues in life, put away from you a deceitful mouth. You see, a half-truth is spoken to deceit, for deceiving, and put perverse lips far from you. Life's issues can be, can, well, they can be... Our heart issues, basically. Those things are taking place in our lives. But see, as we tell a half a truth, right, being a full lie, the lies will actually compound the issues within our lives. So Abraham needed more excuses, too. And we read one here in verse 13. He says, and it came to pass when God caused me to wander. Well, God did this. Now, now I'm going to blame God, by golly. I want to blame him. Blame God. It's all his fault. God caused this thing to happen. He called me to go. He told me, go, go, get away from your brother. And, you know, he told me to do that. <laughs> Always remember this, church. Remember, if God calls you to do something, he will protect you in it. Abraham, he should have trusted God fully. He said, wherever you told me to go, Lord, I will go. You will protect me. You know, Chuck Smith always said, where God guides, he will provide. And he provides everything. He'll provide the finances. He'll provide, he'll provide the opportunities. Where God guides, he will provide. He won't just leave you out there. You can't use that excuse. Well, God sent me here, and now, you know, here I am. Barnhouse writes about Abraham, his commentator. He says, Abraham should have said this instead. And I have to agree with him greatly. <laughs> he should have said this to Abimelech. 
Forgive me, Abimelech, for dishonoring both you and my God. That would have been a great confession. Uh, he says, and my God. My selfish cowardice overwhelmed me. And that was the truth. And I denied my God by fearing that he who called me could not take care of me. He is not as your God of wood and stone. He could have told Abimelech, right? He is a God of glory. He is a living God, the creator, the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. He told me he would be my shield and my exceeding great reward and a supplier of all my needs. In sinning against him, I sinned against you. Forgive me, Abimelech. I love what Barnhouse wrote there. He writes another thing. He says, there is a terrible meaning in the verb that he used, wander. I found this interesting. There's several ways that this word could come out. But the verb he used, wander, in the Hebrew, which Abraham uses, the Hebrew word occurs exactly 50 times, it says, in Scripture, and never in a good sense. He caused me to wander, he says, right? God caused me to do this wandering. It is used of animals going astray, of a drunken man reeling or staggering, of sinful seduction. God caused me to do all these things. He used a terrible word of the prophet's lies causing the people to err, of a path of lying heart. Six other words are translated wander. Any one, the commentator says, of which Abraham might have used, but he used the worst word available. God caused me to sin. Whoa. That's what he said. Verse 14. Then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, male, female servants, and gave them to Abraham. And he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, see, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. He says, hey, you can dwell anywhere on this land, right? Dwell where it pleases you. Then to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother. <laughs> you see how he turns it on him. Yeah, that's great, Abimelech. I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus she was rebuked too. Good job, Abimelech. Rebuke his wife also. So Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech's uh, what his wife and his female servants, then they bore children, for the Lord had closed up the wounds of, of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife, Abraham's wife. So we read all this and we see that Abimelech, he he gives these gifts, right? Uh, gifts given to Abraham there. He gives them these gifts. It's interesting. It's like heaping coals upon Abraham's head, right? Coals of fire for what Abraham had done. Proverbs 25, 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. He really was an enemy. If he's hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap coals of fire on his head and the Lord will reward you. In reality, Abraham should have gave stuff to Abimelech to make up for what he had done. He should have gave him. Abraham was absolutely and totally in the wrong. Now, I want to make a note here. Here we are, Abimelech gives him all this stuff, this silver, all these things. It's interesting that Abraham received these from this pagan king. He received them. Remember the last time with King Sodom? Back there, if you want to look at chapter 14, with the king of Sodom, where he went to go rescue Lot, and rescue, he was Lot was living in Sodom, so he also rescued the king of Sodom. That wasn't so. He didn't receive anything from him. In verse 21, he said, Now the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. You go ahead and take all this reward. Right? He told him, you take the reward. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, my God most high, and possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing, he says. I'm not going to take anything from a thread to a sandal strap, and, uh, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I've made you rich. Boy, he had higher ground, right? Moral higher ground then. 
He with this king here in Sodom, and now what's he doing? He's taking all this from another pagan out there. See, Abraham's higher moral ground has been compromised now. It's been compromised. He couldn't stand on that moral ground anymore. He farmed it hard, very hard to maintain that high moral ground because of what he had done, the sin he went through. Again, compromise, compromise. We've seen it in Lot. I mentioned that word compromise so many times. We've seen it with Lot. He compromised. Compromise, church, when we compromise in anything, God's word, you compromise in your life, guaranteed it will lead to more and more compromise. And then the second verse will be the same as the first. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Ah, God, there's so much to learn from these patriarchs of the Bible. Great Abraham, Lord. He's just a man like us. He's just a sinner. You had grace and mercy on him, and you let him. Father God, uh, we thank you. We thank you that uh, you're so kind to us in the same way, Lord, forgiving. Thank you for this time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.